All right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. It's always a pleasure to be a guest speaker at your events. Um, so let me briefly introduce myself uh, to those who, uh, who haven't met me before. Um, I, am a, um, I am an animist predominantly. Um, I am inspired by um, hunter-gatherer cultures. I'm mostly interested in our deepest, deepest past history. Uh, so mostly, uh, mostly the Stone Ages. I uh, like to research some obscure stories, obscure myths, and uh, see how I can use them to uh, to inform my uh, my day to day day to day life and my day to day practice. So I hope what I will show you today uh, is interesting uh, for you, and hopefully you will find something something new in it. So, living waters. Um, the topic is a bit uh, is a bit of a pun because uh, you know if we were supposed to really take a deep dive into the lore of uh, of uh, the waterscapes of the circumpolar area and its cultures, it would take much much longer than just than just an hour, um, and uh, we will basically graze the surface uh, today. Uh, so I will, I will try to give you as much information as possible, but I will also try to allow some space for you to explore things on your own and to discover things on your own. So I will try, uh, try and do my best to give you, to give you some clues and some, uh, and some hints. Um, at uh, where to look for interesting information, and hopefully you will find, find some inspiring parallels today. All right, so let's uh, let's get let's get moving. So today I will try to I will try to tell you a story, and while telling this story, I will try to see and show you uh, how. Uh, the ability that our um, our early ancestors gained uh, to use external symbols as mnemonic devices and as vehicles to share ideas and stories and to basically create create cultures and how how it changed us and how it allowed us to uh, to come up with all the fantastic, uh, all the fantastic uh, stories and religions that uh, that we know today uh, from the past times, uh, we will take a look at how uh, being able to share these stories and cultivate uh, certain traditions uh, increased and reinforced the ability to survive and thrive um, of our uh, of our ancestors in their respective environments. And today we will focus mostly, mostly on, the, on the water escapes. So uh, this will be, uh, this will be our, our main theme. Uh, we will also try to create a map of, uh, of spiritual landscape uh, using the symbols and stories that we will, we will talk about. We will try, try to uh, sort of get, get the lay of the land and see uh, how it can uh, how it can be used in a creative way and lastly uh, we will try to find out how how the knowledge and how the familiarity of the spiritual uh, landscape and, the, and its cultural elements can uh, can uh, can actually be applied in our in our day-to-day day-to-day lives And okay, so how are we going to tell this story? Uh, there are three main tools that I usually use to uh, to work out uh, to work out the stories and the myths that I that I find and to to examine them to to analyze them. Uh, and uh, three main methods that I use to uh, that I use to 
uh, evaluate and connect the dots when it comes to, to different aspects of culture, like material culture, like, like stories, myths, uh, practices. Uh, first, of, first, is, um, first is mnemonics, and this is actually a new, uh, a new tool in my box. Uh, I have just recently started uh, started getting into it, and it turned out to be very helpful and actually pretty fascinating. Uh, mnemonics combines a, a range of disciplines, such as you know psychology, uh, cognitive science, uh, our approach to education, uh, different methodologies. Uh, it basically examines how. Uh, how cognitive pro pro processes are uh, are used to store and uh, pass on the data or the information that we uh, that we that we gather, and this is uh, this has especially especially interesting uh, interesting applications when it comes to uh, really really distant past and uh, examining how the symbology used by uh, by our early ancestor works and how we can how we can read it next one is ethnoarchaeology and ethnoarchaeology is also an interdisciplinary field and it uh, base it combines uh, combines uh, archaeology and ethnography it, uh, it allows us to use our experience and our knowledge of current cultures uh, or the recently, uh, recently extinct societies uh, to interpret material culture or stories, legends, and myths of past times. Uh, it allows us to sort of fill, out, uh, fill in this, these gaps that we that we have in our knowledge and connect the dots, the dots a little bit better. And of course, lastly, we have uh, we have folkloristics, and folkloristics um, uh, is mostly concerned with with narratives, legends, folk tales, customs, rituals, how they spread, how they change, how they evolve. How they are shared, how they influence each other, and this also plays into this uh, this ethnoarchaeological aspect of uh, of the research when it comes to really really distant distant past. So how does it how does it actually work when it when we try to uh, get into uh, when we try to get into the meanings and reading of uh, this uh, early art and symbols that uh, that are left uh, for uh, for us to to, to interpret, uh, we can uh, establish uh, establish a certain path of path of action, or we can reconstruct a certain path of uh, path of action that our ancestors took to encode and to use um, and to use information encoded in their in their symbols so we start with the exogrammatic record so uh, an exogram is anything that carries that carries information and that is understood in the same way by uh, by the creator and by the audience so it can be uh, it can be rock carving rock painting um, uh, any set of abstract symbols uh, on any kind of uh, on any kind of medium uh, that uh, depicts something. Uh, from this exo this exogrammatic record is uh, used to reinforce uh, the telling and the retelling and sharing of stories and and tales. So these stories and tales, based on those uh, on those uh, symbols that are recorded in, in some way, uh, this way or another, usually usually in some uh, in some uh, graphical way, uh, they are descriptions of some actions that need to be performed, or, or they are supposed to be they are supposed to be performs, performed the uh, the way of doing things uh, the way of uh, the way of acting 
It can, uh, it can uh, relate to anything. It can relate to practices. It can, to relate, it can relate to rituals. It can relate to survival strategies, uh, the, way of, uh, the way of living, the way of hunting, uh, the way of performing certain tasks. Anything basically can be rewarded, uh, recorded in this, uh, in this particular, particular manner. So let us move. Uh, let us move on. Uh, for for my research and for for this presentation, I chose a specific um, a specific uh, area, a specific place, uh, for several uh, for several for, se for several reasons. First of all, this is my this is my home turf. So I I live in the Baltic in the Baltic area. And uh, this is uh, this is the the place the the land that I'm really connected to. And uh, second, this is uh, when it comes to examining the past. This is sort of a sort of a fringe area, where many uh, many stories and many myths and practices based on those myths and stories survived until very recently or, or are still being still still being practiced so it is uh, it is pretty uh, it is pretty fascinating to discover uh, to discover all those uh, all those fascinating uh, fascinating stories that are away from the mainstream away from the uh, uh, from uh, the main current of changes of, of, of history. And there are some, uh, there are some really some gems and some, uh, and some, some treasures uh, to be discovered, uh, to be discovered there. Uh, another thing is that uh, this area this area retained its original character for a very long time. And as I mentioned before, I'm predominantly interested in, uh, in hunter-gatherer cultures, and this area kept its character uh, well into the, into the Iron Age. So we still have some Iron Age, uh, Iron Age some written Iron Age uh, sources, that actually refer to the way of life of these people at that time and describe their way of life as, uh, as predominantly hunter-gatherer. So this is another, an, an, another criterion that, uh, uh, that this was kind of a key for me to, to choose this, uh, this place as my main source of, uh, main point of interest. So let's uh, let's move on. Uh, those of you who have seen my previous uh, my pre previous presentation, uh, the uh, distant echoes that I strongly encourage you to watch, as uh, the, as this today is uh, complementary uh, to that previous one. Uh, those of you who have seen it might be familiar with uh, with this picture. Because what we see here uh, describes uh, describes the shared hunter gatherer uh, hunter gatherer uh, view of uh, of the cosmos. So we have this threefold uh, this threefold division into sky, land, and sea, which is frequently uh, frequently uh, reflected in the in the rock art in the area that I mentioned before. So. Uh, the general area of, of Fenoscandia and uh, other uh, other countries uh, surrounding the Baltic Sea. Uh, this is uh, this is also uh, the kind of the kind of uh, cosmic division that uh, recurs uh, in other areas in this in the circumpolar zone. So also we, we can we can also find this in. Um, uh, in North America, we can also find this uh, uh, find this in in northern Eurasia. Uh, so this is uh, this is a common uh, a common thing. This is this is uh, sort of our our shared heritage. 
Now these uh, these rock carvings they usually uh, they usually uh, occurred in specific places, and these places were uh, the meeting points between land uh, between land, water, and sky. So usually the water line somewhere where you could see the horizon, uh, touch the water, and where you could observe the sun setting. Uh, setting beyond the horizon. These were usually places um, uh, places used for uh, for public rituals. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, this uh, uh, this uh, this rock art, these uh, these rock carvings, were frequently used as uh, as illustrations of. Uh, the stories being told and the rituals being enacted. So it all, tie, all tie, tied together in those, in those places. The pictures, the words, and the actions, just like uh, the sky, land, and sea met in those places, in the same way, uh, these aspects of, of, of spiritual practices uh, met together, converged in that in, in those uh, in those spots, so let's take a look at one of those uh, those spots. So, what you can see here is the shore of Lake Onega, which is currently uh, the territory of uh, of north uh, northwestern Russia. And this is a typical a typical picture of uh, of a place like that. So you can see. Uh, you can clearly see the horizon where the water meets the sky. You can uh, you can see the uh, you can see the uh, uh, the petroglyphs uh, engraved on in in the rocks, and uh, these petroglyphs are telling a story. They are telling a story which uh, which was probably being retold in that place many many times over, and th based on those stories. Uh, some rituals were uh, were enacted, and uh, and uh, some uh, and some of, and, and some of those stories were probably celebrated. So this is a, this is a very good representative example of, of a place like that. And uh, the oldest uh, location of this character uh, that we know of uh, goes back to nine thousand years ago. Uh, it's uh, so it's well into the into the Mesolithic, and uh, what we see here on Lake uh, on Lake Onega, this uh, this site goes back to uh, uh, goes back to the Neolithic, the break of the Neolithic and the uh, and the Bronze Age, so more or less more or less uh, uh, four thousand years ago, and uh, this. Um, this area, like I mentioned, it retained its uh, its hunter-gatherer character and its uh, hunter-gatherer uh, economic uh, economic model, so to say. Uh, so very cl closely, co very closely uh, connected to the land and um, and and the the animals and uh, uh, the cycles uh, that were uh, happening uh, happening there. Uh, but uh, you know, petroglyphs uh, aren't uh, aren't the only uh, ritual sites that we can identify on the edges of the Baltic Sea. Uh, predominantly on the northern part of the coastline, uh, we can meet some more, let's say, advanced and more and more sophisticated structures uh, devoted to ritual use, and that point toward the perception of uh, of the water as uh, as the underworld and the the shoreline the waterline as as the entrance to uh, to to that underworld so the kind of cairns that uh, you can see here in the picture this this is an example from uh, from the south of, of Sweden Mm, they have been constructed uh, all over the northern shoreline of uh, of the Baltic Sea, uh, starting from the Neolithic, uh, when uh, the lifestyle became more sedentary, 
uh, so more of a mixed model between uh, between nomadic and 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 sedentary when uh, uh, hunter-gatherer uh, family groups would move around a certain area only not uh, and not move all the time, uh, constantly changing location. But every every family group group would have a specific um, would have a specific or uh, tr a specific uh, area to which they stuck and where they rotated between certain encampments, for example. So uh, this uh, this perception of uh, of uh, the uh, of the water of, of of the of the coast as the go uh, as the gate to to the to the underworld was also a a, a shared um, a shared motive uh, in the entire circumpolar area at the time. Something also uh, also worth uh, worth noting. So now I would like to invite you to participate a little bit in this presentation because I would like to invite you for a little treasure hunt. Now, if you could grab your phones um, and take a picture of the screen of, you can, of what you can see here. What my intention is, is I would like you to have this image in front of, in front of your eyes, and, or at least on hand, as we progress through the rest of the presentation. And uh, I would like you to try to identify uh, the, these elements that we are going to talk about in this in this picture, so this is sort of a of a rock art of of, of my own of a, a, a rock um, a, a rock record of a uh, of a of a certain story of a certain myth uh, that I prepared, and uh, I would like to try to identify certain certain elements, and in the end of this presentation, we will actually tell this story, and we will see how many of these elements we could we could spot and identify and how the story ties together so uh, if you'd like take a uh, take a snap of this uh, of this screen and we will we will move on So the first, uh, the first character we are going to talk about is the serpent. So I'm not uh, men uh, mentioning any, any specific names of deities or spirits uh, on purpose at the moment, uh, because our, uh, the, our ancestors seemed to draw, um, draw inspiration for their symbols. Uh, directly from from their environment in which they in which they, in which they lived in which they fun they function. So uh, the symbology is usually very simple. It's not as sophisticated as we as we know it from from learn, from, from later times. It's uh, it's more it's more connected. Uh, I would say it's not to say that. Um, uh, it's not to say that it's it's primitive, but it's definitely definitely more down to earth and more direct. So when we when we talk about the serpent as a as a as a water spirit, uh, it is hard not to mention other spirit, one other spirit as well, because in the rock art. Uh, in rock art, in in in, uh, in those in those images, um, the serpent usually comes comes in a tag team with one other spirit, and I am sure uh, some of you already may know where this is going. So to uh, to those uh, to those of you uh, who uh, practice Gaulish polytheism. This is most likely a very, very familiar sight. So we have several, uh, several images of, uh, of an antlered god here. Of course, we're talking about, about Kernanos. The first one is uh, 
the image from Valka Monica, uh, which is notoriously, notoriously difficult to, uh, notoriously difficult to date because Valka Monica functioned as a as a as a ritual site most likely uh, from from uh, uh, early Neolithic until uh, late Iron Age. Uh, so that's uh, that's a bit of a challenge to date certain certain images. But the second one is pretty interesting. It's from uh, it's from uh, it's from the USA, and it's nearly identical. And of course, uh, the last one, very iconic, uh, very iconic um, uh, image from the uh, Gundenstrup cauldron panel, which goes back to uh, to Latin period. Uh, so these, uh, I don't have to explain to you why the how these how these images are are similar uh, to uh, to each other. Uh, we have serpents in them, and and in two cases, these serpents are actually are actually horned. So uh, in the second and in the third picture, uh, the serpents have. Uh, uh, have uh, have horns, uh, and here uh, another set of uh, set of images, but they uh, have something a little bit different in common. Uh, two of them are also images uh, images uh, of uh, well statues of uh, of Cernunos. Uh, but the first one. Uh, also from uh, from from Utah, from from the USA, uh, depicts a um, depicts a horned serpent making an attempt at a, probably some kind of some kind of dish, some kind of a some kind of a container, some kind of a cup, or something something similar. Uh, there is an interpretation of this image uh, that. Um, this is a snake attempting to uh, access a bird's nest, uh, but this is this isn't really clear uh, in this image. So I think all all interpretations are are possible here, but uh, the other two images are much much clearer. And what uh, they have in common is that we can see the horned serpent. Uh, well, consuming something from uh, from a from from a container from a from a dish uh, held by uh, held by kernels. Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, another common common theme in these uh, in the in these pictures. So where where are we getting? Uh, what are we getting at? Uh, these. Uh, this tag team goes back goes back a long uh, a long way, and we will talk about it in a moment. Uh, another uh, another deity or another several deities uh, that uh, are depicted with uh, with snakes or serpents, who also seem to be consuming something, and in this case, uh, most likely most likely eggs are uh, Sirona and Higea. Uh, good pictures, good pictures of uh, of of uh, statues of, or reliefs of um, of Sirona are hard to come by, so I only included one here. Uh, but and the rest uh, of the images are of uh, of Higea, but the theme remains remains the same. Uh, we have an uh, we have a snake consuming consuming eggs. And of course, I couldn't help myself but include a, a, a curiosity here, uh, a modern statue of Higea that can be seen in Krakow on one of the Art Deco townhouses uh, in the city in the city center. And this is a more modern take, of course, uh, with Higea holding a, a staff on, around which the serpent is, uh, is, uh, is wrapped, it's climbing on. All right, so let's uh, let's explain this this tag team of uh, of snakes and uh, and deities, especially especially when it comes to the tag team of 
uh, of the horned serpent and uh, and uh, and Kern and Oz. So as we know, um, as we know, uh, moose are moose are very good, very good divers, prolific divers, and uh, they frequently dive to feed. They are very good swimmers, and uh, with an our ancestors looking for clues. Uh, and for inspiration for their symbols uh, in their immediate environment, uh, this image of a of a swimming of a swimming moose with only antlers sticking out uh, be quickly became a, became became a symbol for a, for a vessel for a uh, for a boat. And here on the right, uh, sorry, on the left, you can see. You can see an example of um, of an image like that from uh, uh, from uh, from Finland. Uh, very often in rock art, this uh, this antler boat or this uh, this symbolic representation of a, uh, of of a moose as as water spirit is depicted as a. Uh, as a boat being accompanied by something, or a boat being accompanied by um, being shadowed by by something else. So, as you can see, we have we have antler boats here, and uh, in each case, um, this antler boat is uh, well moving along along something, some something uh, that's underneath it. Uh, there is some. There is always some company. There is something something else going on here. So, uh, most researchers, most scholars, interpret it as um, as a snake, as a serpent, which represents water, just like uh, just like a serpent, uh, uh, a serpent in case of, for example, Hygeia or um, or Sirona represents represents the healing power of of water. Uh, it's it's the same case here. Uh, the uh, the moose and the um, and the and the snake as a, as a symbol of of water are are simply inseparable. Uh, also, uh, in several in several examples uh, here you, on the on the right side and oh, sorry on the left side you can see. Uh, you can see the symbols of uh, of the sun. This is uh, an uh, mm, this is an allusion to uh, to uh, a myth about the moose uh, the moose stealing the sun. So every uh, every uh, every autumn, the moose grabs the sun in its antlers and proceeds to. Uh, to run away to the underworld, and every mm, and every autumn, uh, the bear uh, follows it to retrieve the sun to reemerge uh, to reemerge in the spring, bringing nature back to uh, back to life. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's move on. So this motive of um, uh, this motive of uh, of an antler boat of a of a moose boat is uh, very common in the circumpolar area and especially in this uh, in the area of the Baltic Sea uh, in the in the Fennel Scandia. Uh, there are many burials, um, many examples of burials in in boats uh, in boats having a moose uh, a moose head. At the front, we can see an, an an example of a reconstruction of a boat like that on or here on the right. And uh, uh, this is actually this is actually a, a very a very common recurring a recurring theme, and uh, uh, a common uh, burial uh, burial practice in the in the uh, in this area. Uh, here we can see a, another depiction uh, of it, a little bit more, uh, you know, artistic interpretation, modern inter interpretation of a um, of a of a boat uh, of a boat burial. Uh, here we can see an individual uh, buried in um, in a dugout canoe, uh, wrapped in 
uh, wrapped in, uh, in the moose skin with moose antlers. Mm, this was supposed to this was supposed to ensure the, mm, uh, the passage to the uh, to the underworld for the soul of the, uh, of the deceased. So we can clearly see the um, uh, clearly see uh, the role of uh, of the moose as a as a psychopomp, as the one who can uh, uh, who can uh, assist the soul in transition. From this world into into another, just like just like the actual real moose is uh, is a good diver, it can uh, it can uh, easily travel uh, from our world to the world under. It can also its spirit can um, can ensure the safe passage uh, to uh, uh, to the underworld for the uh, for the spirit of a human. And you can see an example of a journey like that uh, on the right side. This is a, mm, uh, this is a carving from um, this is a carving from um, the Evenk territory in western in western Siberia. It actually uh, it actually shows um, a journey of a soul uh, from its from uh, its place of origin. So from uh, its tribal camp that is marked with number number four at the bottom, um, in a boat by a river at number three, uh, being assisted by, by a shaman uh, um, carrying a, a drum and uh, an antlered crown and number uh, marked with number one uh, into, into the afterlife. And curiously, uh, in the upper part, you can also see a bird spirit. And uh, this bird spirit uh, is something that we will talk about, that we will talk about in a moment. We will, we will get to it uh, in, a, in a second. So, uh, is the serpent is the serpent only uh, only an accessory uh, here? Is it uh, is it only an a companion, or is it uh, is the serpent something more? Uh, clearly, uh, the serpent uh, the serpent has a very strong uh, a very strong symbolism in uh, in the circumbaltic in the circumbaltic area. And this is uh, this is one example of um, of a symbol like that. This is a, sh a shaman's staff. Uh, not long ago, it was discovered in uh, the south southwestern part of Finland, and it is dated uh, to about uh, four thousand four hundred years uh, years ago. And this most likely had some uh, had some ritual ritual use and. How do we know it had uh, it had ritual it had ritual use? Well, uh, we can uh, we can uh, fall back on petroglyphs. We can fall back on petroglyphs that uh, also uh, depict uh, similar staffs being used in ritual context. So with the first, uh, with the first, uh, first two on the on the left, um, these are from uh, from the Russian part of um, of uh, uh, of uh, the Fenoscandia, and and they uh, they resemble the, the staff that we that we have just uh, that we have just seen. Uh, the uh, remaining uh, the remaining pi uh, pictograms uh, they show uh, the mm, snake sh or serpent shaped staff being used by uh, by a shaman in a, in, a, in a most likely in a ritual in a ritual context uh, with the last one actually showing a shaman with uh, with a with a drum and a, and a, and a, and a stick to beat the, beat the drum and the spirit, uh, the spirit of a snake, uh, accompanying, um, accompanying this uh, 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 this shaman. Uh, a curious, a curious picture is uh, the one marked with letter E. It actually shows, um, 
shows a sort of a communion between the between the shaman and the uh, and the and the snake spirit. It sure it shows the process of um, the process of of shape shifting or of becoming becoming united with with the spirit. And uh, it is a common it is actually a common a common belief in uh, in the area in question that. Um, the shamans or, or you know, knowing people are uh, capable of transforming into, into snakes and, and traveling into the, into the underworld. Uh, not so much in a symbolic sense, but in actual, uh, actual sense. And uh, the picture on the right is something, uh, is something rather curious that I would like you to note. I would like you to compare it with the pictures uh, with the pictures from uh, Lake Onega and Kola Peninsula. So these two locations are very uh, very far from each other. So uh, you know northwestern Russia and New Mexico, but the um, uh, but the uh, res the resemblance of uh, of the or similarity of this these two pictures is quite is quite striking. Uh, actually, one of the one of the hypotheses uh, uh, speaks of um, of a common body of of mythology and a common body of stories uh, being disseminated uh, at the uh, at, at the time of the late uh, late glacial maximum, which would explain the similarity of many of many uh, stories, myths, and uh, also uh, and also graphic symbols. Uh, between uh, between different different locations, so very so very far apart. Uh, so we are talking about uh, about the uh, period of more or less uh, thirteen to eleven thousand years ago. Okay, but you know uh, we also have some uh, have some. Uh, Shaman, some shaman snake staffs of, of our own being used, uh, being used today. Uh, so uh, these are also these can also be found in uh, in antiquity in uh, in the classical times, of course, both in Rome and Greece, uh, especially the uh, the first two uh, the first two pictures from 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 the left. Mm. Uh, but the, uh, I think you can you can already start noticing a certain uh, a, a certain pattern a certain um, a certain theme. There is a that there is a, a snake or two snakes um, uh, that is uh, is a creature of uh, a creature of uh, of water, a creature of underworld, climbing um, climbing a staff or climbing a tree perhaps. To consume to consume an egg, and while at this point it might seem a bit uh, of a stretch, uh, we will get to a to a point where this uh, will all become more uh, more plausible. And actually, uh, a bit of a a bit of a curiosity. Uh, the symbol on the mm, on the far right that you, um, I'm pretty sure every one of you have already have already seen uh, is ac this is actually called uh, the star of life. So uh, uh, perhaps you know perhaps there is some connection with Sirona. Who knows? <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's move on. So uh, this uh, summing, summing, summarizing the mm, the serpent is the is the spirit that symbolizes the water itself, its healing powers, and uh, it is um, and it is the uh, this uh, this power this uh, this factor that actually allows. Uh, allows the uh, the moose in the in the in the Stone Age cosmology to be uh, to be present all around all around the year, because unlike the the polar opposite of the moose, uh, the bear, 
uh, where the bear has to uh, has to has to uh, fall into its winter slumber. The moose is active throughout the year, and um, this uh, uh, this is usually attributed uh, among scholars to the power of the uh, of the snake, the healing, and the um, and the continued continued rebirth, continued continued immortality. All right, but uh, there is another there is another spirit that we need to take a look at, and uh, we are going to do it right now. Uh, the swan is another water spirit uh, that is frequently encountered in the rock art of the circumbaltic and circumpolar area, uh, and it also has its own uh, has own uh, has its own body of mytholo mythology. And uh, it is also uh, it is also shared over a large uh, a large area of um, uh, of the uh, of the world. So uh, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the swan. Uh, let's take a look at the swan. The, probably the most moving and the most uh, famous, most widely known. Um, um, case of uh, of using the symbolic uh, the, sim uh, the, the, the symbol of the swan in uh, in um, burial rites is this. Uh, this comes from the Danish Mesolithic burial uh, in uh, uh, Vedbeck in um, uh, in Denmark. And this is a burial of a young woman with a with a newborn child, with uh, the child being placed on a placed on a swan wing. Now uh, we know from from uh, from uh, from the stories from the mythology that uh, the swan is um, is also a kind of a psycho a psychopomp. It also it also is a, is a being that can assist in travel in travel to the uh, to the afterlife, uh, but it has a slightly different flavor to it. It has a slightly different air than um, than the than the moose and the and the snake and this and this and the serpent. It's. Uh, it's sort of more uh, more friendly, more uh, more delicate and more um, and 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 warmer. It is more of a soul bird uh, that is uh, that is encountered in in a, a, in a lot of locations uh, in in burials in this um, in this uh, in this area. Uh, so as you can see, there are quite a few of, of those burials uh, where uh, either parts and body parts of swans or uh, or skeletons are uh, are used as a means of transferring the soul of the dead to the to the afterlife. Uh, now. Uh, the swan has a bit of a different uh, a different. Um, um, uh, a different air to it, as I as I said. Um, it's connected more to the sky than to the than to the earth. So while uh, while the moose and this uh, and this serpent were tying together the water and the and the earth, they were transferring between one and the other. Uh, the swan is more of a more of a of a sky spirit. A sky spirit. Uh, this uh, is clearly seen in the interpretation of the Milky Way among the hunter gatherer people uh, of the um, uh, of the northeastern Eastern Europe. So while in Indo Indo European languages Milky Way is associated with uh, you know with milk, as the name suggests. Or as in uh, uh, in the case of uh, as we have here in in this example in Swedish the the, the winter road with snow, uh, 
uh, among uh, among the Finno-Ugric people, it's uh, it's actually the flock of soul birds. It is the flock of, of swans carrying souls to the uh, to the afterlife. Uh, so as as uh, as, it, as it is called in Finnish, the the pathway the pathway of birds. Uh, this uh, also partially results from. Uh, results from the fact that uh, mm, the Finno-Ugric peoples believe in different parts of the soul. So the body soul it goes uh, goes into the ground. It goes to the underworld, to the water, to be reborn as a uh, uh, to for, for this this vitality to be reborn as a as a new animal or as a, as a new creature, as a new being. But this, um, but this spirit part of the soul uh, actually returns uh, returns to the uh, to the sky, to the stars, uh, to the to the source of the of the soul of the soul itself. As the the fire, the sky fire, the sun, the uh, the stars, uh, they are interpreted as the uh, as the source of souls. Uh, okay. So this is actually how far uh, how far swan related myths that are similar to each other uh, go uh, how, how how far how far they spread and uh, this particular example relates to the uh, myth of a skyman maiden or a, or a swan maiden which is present in many cultures and. It also has its uh, predominant, its its very prominent presence in uh, in the general uh, general Celtic uh, Celtic Celtic body of 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 mythology, especially uh, especially in the in the British Isles, especially um, uh, particularly there. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, this is the general this is the general spread of these. Um, of these of these tales, so uh, the sky and maiden myths can be uh, can be divided roughly into two um, two kinds. Uh, one uh, that is more present in the in the western part of Europe and Eurasia, um, that is of of a um, of a supernatural or, a, or or an upper world lover. To a uh, to a mortal, and uh, the uh, the other one that it is a uh, that is more present in in the in the eastern part that it is um, it is an animal 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 spirit that becomes the spouse of a uh, of a human, but in both contexts the union does, usually uh, doesn't doesn't end too well, and uh, it is not. It is not. It is not reconciliated. Uh, so generally, in Uralic contexts, uh, water birds are uh, are soul birds. They are uh, soul symbols. They are messenger messengers between between worlds. Uh, they travel from from one world to another. They connect all three uh, all three levels. So they connect the water, the land, and the sky. Uh, the sky together, as they can exist in all these three environments uh, equally equally well. Uh, as you can see, even even now, uh, even now the um, the image of a bird as a as a depiction of a soul is present in uh, in uh, among the Finno-Ugric people. Um, and uh, here is an example of a of a uh, of an orthodox uh, orthodox cross uh, being topped with a with a soul bird. Uh, so this this reflects the, the belief that uh, when a person dies, the soul leaves in the form in the form of a bird and and travels to the to the afterlife. And uh, this kind of this kind of uh, ideas, this kind of um, this kind of belief, can be can be traced back uh, back to the Mes Mesolithic. So, 
more than more than nine thousand years ago, ago, um, and and it's quite uh, quite prevalent and quite uh, consistent in this uh, in this particular uh, area. All right. So uh, another uh, interesting uh, story about a swan um, is the story of the world of the creation of the world. So uh, um, in the uh, uh, in the Finno-Ugric cosmology, it is the swan or uh, a waterfowl, uh, de depending on um, depending on the on the particular place and version of the myth. Uh, that uh, created uh, created the world from from its egg. So uh, the egg is the source of, uh, in this case, the source of life, the source of the source of rebirth, uh, the source of vital energy, the source of the source of creation itself. Okay, so uh, we have covered quite a lot of those, uh, those themes uh, and different ideas. So now let's take a look. Um, let's take a look at our story. And let's see, uh, let's see if we can reconstruct, uh, uh, reconstruct a myth uh, or several myths in this case, because these are several, several myths depicted here. Uh, and whether we can uh, whether we can uh, actually produce a single coherent story uh, uh, from from all this. All right. So to make it easier, let's start at the um, at the top left. So uh, the story goes like this: uh, when the world was when the world was still quite young, uh, and people were, and the humankind was young, uh, the humans couldn't, uh, couldn't really cope very well uh, in, their, in their environment. They didn't understand how to act. They didn't understand how to live. They didn't understand how to sustain themselves. They were actually quite, quite lost. So the Sheba decided to give them to give them a guide, to give to give them someone who uh, who would uh, serve as a as an example and who would serve as an intermediary be be in between humans and the natural world. She shapeshifted into a woman, and uh, by union with uh, the or with the original bear spirit she gave birth to, uh, to the bear's son, to the little bear. At certain point, as the, uh, as the little bear started growing, he started venturing out of, the, uh, out of the family cave where he noticed the beautiful radiant sun. But soon the sun started, started setting. And so the little bear decided to follow it to see where it uh, to see where it's going. Why is it disappearing? Following the sun's path, the little bear came across a uh, came across a serpent, a serpent who was who was climbing a tree. It was climbing a tree to reach a nest and eat the eggs that were in the nest. Well, the little bear didn't particularly like the idea of the little uh, little birds being devoured, so it actually uh, uh, so it actually took the uh, took the uh, um, uh, took the serpent uh, from the tree and chased it chased it away. Following the sun's uh, following the sun's path, the little bear. Uh, came across several uh, several animals uh, arguing and discussing among each other how to divide a deer carcass uh, between them. There was a mountain lion, there was a wolf, there was an eagle, and there was an ant. So they asked Little Bear to tell them uh, how to divide this uh, this uh, 
this prey animal between them. So the little bear stopped and thought for a moment and uh, decided to do it like this. To the lion, he gave the flesh. To the, uh, to the wolf, he gave the bones, because this is what wolves usually do, right? They gnaw on the, they gnaw on the bones. The, uh, um, uh, uh, the wild cats usually, usually eat the flesh and, uh, and wolves feast on the bones. Now, uh, to the eagle, the bear decided to give the, uh, all the insides of the, uh, of the deer, because the, uh, the eagle has no teeth, so it is easier for, uh, for it to eat the soft parts. And to the ant, uh, the bear gave the marrow, because the ant is small and it doesn't really need much. So, uh, uh, being grateful for the bear for reconciliating this, this argument, this conflict, each animal gave the bear a little something, a little gift. So uh, the lion and the wolf gave him tufts of fur, uh, the eagle gave it, uh, gave it a, a, a feather, and the ant one of its legs, because it had many. So it wasn't really a problem. Uh, these gifts allowed the bear to shapeshift into any of the animals when needed. So then the, so then the story goes like this. The bear moves on along the sun's path and comes to a, comes to a camp, uh, a camp where uh, uh, where, the, where, where, the beautiful, uh, where the beautiful sun that he uh, noticed earlier tended to an old, uh, an old spirit. And this old spirit, this old elk, uh, didn't, want the, uh, didn't want to let the sun, the sun go. So while the elk was away, uh, the uh, the bear asked uh, asked the son how to how to set it free how to how to beat how to how to kill uh, kill the elk and the son admitted that well the elk was immortal so it couldn't be killed however they could use a certain um, a certain trick to get to know what to do. Uh, uh, what strategy to use to uh, actually free the sun from, uh, from its imprisonment. The bear uh, used his ability to shape shift into an ant and climb the tree. And while, uh, while the sun was tending to the, uh, to the old elk's tangled fur, uh, the sun asked, uh, about uh, uh, about uh, the source of the uh, of the elk's immortality, and the elk said something along these lines. Well, uh, to kill me, you first have to defeat me. First, I will sh I will turn into uh, into a hare, and uh, the contestant would have to turn into a wolf and kill me in this form then I would turn into a porcupine or a, uh, or a, uh, uh, or a hedgehog. And the, uh, and the contestant would have to, uh, contender would have to kill me as a, in the form of a lion. And lastly, I would turn into a swan and the contender would have to kill me as an eagle. Uh, from this, uh, from uh, from the swan, the uh, you, uh, the contender should take the egg, and then my twin brother will appear uh, in the form of a snake. And if you break this egg on my twin brother's uh, twin brother's head, I will become a more uh, I will become mortal and die and die. And so the bear followed. A little, a little bear, bear, bear followed this, um, this information, killed the elk, and retrieved the sun to the surface. 
and so the and so the uh, the spring and life could return uh, could return to the world. Okay, uh, this is it. Thank you very much. I hope you uh, you managed to get uh, some interesting information uh, for yourselves uh, and some inspiration for further research uh, from this presentation. And uh, as always, it was a pleasure. Uh, it was a pleasure to uh, to be here and be able to uh, to present for you. Thank you so much. <laughs>